Eclectic Humanist, Episode 2. Before I get into the actual content, I should probably say that when I envisioned this series, this is not the second episode that I planned to make. I always intended to address current events, but I saw the series initially getting off to a more historical start, looking into the various humanisms that I want to address for as long as it happens that I end up doing this. But as I mentioned in the introductory episode, we live in really unusual times. We already lived in unusual times before the riots that erupted in Minneapolis and are currently going on all over the U.S. and the demonstrations that are picking up all over the world in support of that particular civil rights movement. And I find, sitting here in my nice, safe apartment in eastern Canada, as the world deals with its first major pandemic in a hundred years, and as North American society, and particularly American society, erupts in the latest installment of its ongoing saga of racial violence, that I can't just be a quiet academic producing a quietly educational podcast, which is how I originally envisioned this. Whatever ideas we discuss, whatever ideas are operative in society, whatever's floating around in the air, I think it needs to be understood in terms of how we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, how we understand our engagement with each other, with ourselves, with those parts of the world that are beyond our immediate reach, and yet that we can affect indirectly in so many very subtle ways. So today, I will be talking about Confucianism as it relates to current events, particularly to events surrounding the ongoing Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Now, as I said, this is unplanned. I have in mind a long series on that particular humanist philosophy. And the thinker I'll be addressing today, Mencius, is the, the second major thinker in the tradition. I had not planned to even mention his name for a few months. But as it turns out, I think I simply need to give a bit of a summary of what Confucianism is, and then return to any of the details in subsequent episodes, which I will do probably numerous times. For now, though, let's just set things up. So we should probably start with just a few facts. On Monday, May 25th, George Floyd, a black man, died with Officer Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck, where it had been for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, while Mr. Floyd, a resident of a suburb of Minneapolis, was saying that he couldn't breathe. This even continuing for more than two minutes after Mr. Floyd had become unresponsive. Derek Chauvin has since been arrested and indicted on the charge of third-degree murder, which was recently bumped up to second-degree murder, and the three officers who were with him have also recently been arrested and charged. Almost immediately after those events, of course, demonstrations began popping up in Minneapolis, initially peaceful, and met before too long by police with tear gas. Since then, the demonstrations have become much less than peaceful, and there is good evidence of a number of agent provocateurs among them stirring up unrest and violence and destruction to serve agendas other than redressing the wrongs that the black American population so desperately needs redressed, because of course this is not an isolated incident. This is simply one among a long, long, long list of well-documented acts of police brutality against black men, who themselves are disproportionately more likely to be met with lethal force then, for example, white men, when you look at the data per capita rather than simply the raw numbers. And this is simply one example or one facet of the systemic racism that has plagued American society since before there was a United States of America. This goes back 400 years to the slave trade. And more recently, it goes back to the Jim Crow laws. And more recently, it goes back to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. The African-American population has decided again, it would seem, and I would hope, that they've had enough. Yet what I hear from so many middle-class white people, my demographic, is not 
outrage at the conditions that led up to these demonstrations, but rather outrage at the property destruction that is occurring during the riots. So I need to make something clear here. I support the demonstrators. I support them absolutely. I think they're on the moral high ground, even if they destroy some property. And the reason is this. These events are not isolated. There is a long history of the African-American community trying to get a peaceful resolution to the social inequities and the social inequities that plague American society. The most obvious example I can think of right now is the Take a Knee movement. That was peaceful, respectful, and yet shouted down by so many of the same demographic that are currently decrying the destruction of, oh, I don't know, Targets or McDonald's because they thought it was disrespectful to the flag. Well, yeah, fine. Taking a knee during the national anthem to draw, to draw awareness to exactly the situation that got Mr. Floyd killed. This is disrespectful? This is something that you're not supposed to do because it's inappropriate? Now's not the time? There have been numerous peaceful marches, numerous petitions, numerous attempts over generations to try to have this situation fixed. And it has been met with either blindness, dismissal, bad faith bargaining, virtually every step of the way, and condemned virtually every step of the way by the same group who is now condemning the destruction of private property. So fine, what is a person supposed to do? If peaceful demonstration doesn't work, and non-peaceful demonstration doesn't work, what are the options? Accept oppression or die? Or simply accept oppression and die? I don't see any other way that's being proposed by the, uh, by the white middle class law and order crowd. If people are not negotiated with in good faith, and if their dignity is affronted in an ongoing systemic abuse, their dignity will assert itself, and it will assert itself in rage. And when that rage happens, blame does not belong on the ones who are justifiably enraged. It belongs on the ones who did not have the integrity or honesty or basic human decency to address their concerns in the first place. Holding the property destruction against an oppressed people when they stand up against their oppression makes about as much sense as putting a pot of water on a hot stove and then blaming the water when the pot boils over. Primary responsibility lies with the person whose hand controls the dial. And this brings us around to the question that probably some of you are wondering now, what the hell does any of this have to do with Confucianism? So now I should probably tell you something about Confucianism. So how do I give a quick synopsis of a philosophic system that's about 2,500 years old. Well, let's see. Confucius was, I guess what we might call a lower echelon aristocrat in the state of Lu, and his dates are roughly 551 to 479 BCE. This is an important period because at this time, Chinese society as a whole was just on the verge of entering something called the Warring States period, during which powerful nobles were constantly vying for influence and power over each other because the emperor had become very weak. This is a time of social disintegration, of, of the disintegration or undermining of social institutions, of rampant corruption, of self-interest taking precedence over public service. So in many ways then, a society suffering from a lot of the same ills that North American society and American society in particular is tragically suffering from right now. Confucius, as a scholar and a teacher and a civil servant committed to public service, was distressed by the disintegration he saw going on around him. As a remedy, well, as part of his remedy, he tried to appeal to a set of virtues that seemed to have served his society well in the past, but that he saw being abandoned in his own time. 
So in a real sense, Confucianism is an innately conservative philosophy. It, it looks towards maintaining social stability in the face of social disintegration. The purpose, though, for Confucius is not stability. It is human well-being. And well-being not just in a material sense, but more importantly, in an ethical sense. Confucianism is what's known as a virtue ethic. The purpose of the philosophy or religion, you can look at it both ways, the distinction is really meaningless in Chinese culture, is to cultivate virtues in oneself so that one can both live a good life and contribute to the life of the community. In this sense, there is really nothing more important in Confucianism than the cultivation of one's own good character. But what does it mean exactly to cultivate your character? There are several virtues that the Confucian tradition holds as important. For the time being, I'm going to focus on the most important two. The first in Chinese is Ren. This is translated most commonly as humanity or benevolence. The second in Chinese is Yi, which is translated most commonly as righteousness or duty. Now, I prefer the translations humanity and righteousness, so those are the ones I'm going to use. As for humanity, in classical Chinese, as in English, the words for the virtue on the one hand and simply a human being on the other hand are the same. At least they're pronounced the same. They have slightly different characters. This is the central virtue. This is a virtue that in the Analects, which I will be doing several episodes on in the future, Confucius spends a lot of time not quite defining, but talking around. It's not just treating people well, that is, with benevolence. It also involves seeing others as you see yourself, recognizing your common nature with your fellow humans. In fact, the virtue cannot be worked out, it cannot be present in isolation. It must be worked out in community. Actually, the character for the virtue Ren in classical Chinese is a composite of two characters. The character for the human being Ren, which resembles a person walking, and the character for the number two, fused together into a single character. That is, the logic of humanity is that being human is being active, hence the walking part of the character. And the virtue of humanity can only be worked out with someone else. What this points to is the necessity of community for any kind of virtuous conduct on the one hand, and the need for community where the individual is concerned. Righteousness, ye, is concerned with right action. Again, it, this can be translated duty as well. Sometimes humanity and righteousness are treated as flip sides of each other, the interior state and the exterior presentation of it. Personally, I'm a little dubious of that simple pairing. And again, I'll have episodes on this coming up. The main point I want to make for our purposes today in this very brief, almost caricatured summary of these two virtues is that they are founded in community and they're also required for community. That is, a community that does not recognize the common humanity of everyone in it. That is, a community in which people don't conduct themselves righteously, dutifully, you could say morally, if you like, isn't going to flourish. It's not going to be a community that will be healthy in itself or healthy for individuals to live in. So all of the Confucian virtues are ultimately founded on these, on these two, humanity and righteousness, which can only be present in community. And now the scribbled on page of scratch pad that is passing for the script for this episode is telling me it's time to move on to start talking about Mencius, but it turns out I've left out one really important virtue. So I'm going to have to talk for a couple of minutes about that. The virtue is Li, translated alternately as ritual and propriety. I like ritual, so that's what I will generally use. This is the third of the Confucian virtues. And when I say ritual, probably the impression that a lot of people have is formal rites, ceremonies, that kind of thing. You know, wedding ceremonies or uh, the swearing in of a president, for example, 
or the formalities surrounding a funeral, or any other of those many, many ceremonies, many rites or, or rituals that mark off important moments in our society and in our culture, in any society, in any culture. And that certainly is part of what I mean. But what ritual also means in the Confucian sense is those, those smaller rituals, such as manners, holding a door for someone, greeting someone politely rather than rudely, a general showing of respect, a general recognition of common humanity indicated through small gestures of behavior sincerely meant. But it's also important in the current, uh, in the current context. This will become clear in just a moment. That's all I need to say about ritual right now. I think you get the idea. So it's time to move on to talk about Mencius. Now, Mencius's dates are about 372 to 289 BCE, so he never crossed paths with Confucius. He was taught by Confucius's grandson, though, and he's generally seen as the most important interpreter of Confucius's work, and he expands on Confucius's ideas in some really interesting ways. His work, named after him, very much like the Analects by Confucius, wasn't actually written by him. Both works were composed by students recollecting things that their teachers, Confucius or Mencius, had said after those particular teachers had died. So these aren't direct documents of these thinkers' thoughts, but they are records of their thoughts, often recorded by people who remember them. And even in many ways, regardless of historicity, important for their ethical content. Now, where Men what Mencius does that Confucius doesn't do, is he lays out a much more fully developed theory of human nature. And by doing that, provides a much firmer foundation on which to build a system of Confucian ethics. Now, he isn't the only person who does this. He's the first person who does this, and I think the most important, and really, honestly, one of my favorite thinkers of all time. So I will be talking about him a lot in this series. But for our purposes right now, I just want to focus on a couple of passages from his book. To set those up, I'll just say that Mencius's understanding of human nature is that we are naturally inclined towards benevolence, towards humanity, towards compassion. That is, Mencius sees ethical behavior as rooted in human nature, as arising as a logical extension of what we already are. He uses agricultural imagery a lot to develop this theory. He refers to things he calls sprouts, which are those little kernels in us that properly cultivated can blossom into a fully developed ethical character. That is, we're not born good, fully good, but we're born with the inclination to be good. And that inclination, those sprouts as he calls them, can be either cultivated or blighted by both our conduct, our behavior, and the environment in which we live. That is, Mencius argues not only for an innate human tendency toward goodness or tendency toward virtue, but also for a very close and very organic relationship between the growth of that virtue and the environment in which we live. That is, there is there's responsibility, there's personal responsibility, always in Confucianism, but for Mencius, that responsibility is not radically individual. While we are responsible to a very large degree for our conduct, we're not responsible for the environment in which we, uh, in which we live, and Mencius recognizes in ways that since then social scientists have empirically demonstrated that our context is going to have an influence on our ethical or moral behavior. And therefore, those who control the context also bear some responsibility for the outcome. Or to put it differently and maybe more simply, if you put a potentially good person in a very bad situation, you cannot expect that person to become as good as they would have been had their situation been better. As for the book itself, which I can't recommend highly enough, 
it consists for the most part of recountings of conversations that Mencius, or in some cases one of his students, has with one or another of a long list of deeply flawed rulers. Mencius, like Confucius, toured around trying to find someone, some ruler, who would put his political theory into practice because he's living in the depths, in the, in the, in the heart of the Warring States period that, that Confucius only saw the beginnings of. And he, like Confucius, is trying to put an end to the chaos, to bring some sense of stability back to his society so that people at large can actually flourish. So what Mencius also does throughout, through these conversations is he lays out, again, working from Confucius's ideas, but really taking things, I think, further than Confucius does. He develops a pretty good pretty solid theory of political legitimacy. That is, one of the questions that is pondered throughout the book is not just how can a ruler rule or how should a ruler rule, but what business does a ruler have in ruling? How can a ruler justify his rule? Or to put it in modern terms, how can a regime justify its existence and continuance. And for Mencius, what this comes down to always is the condition of the people who are ruled. That is, the government governs for the sake of the governed. So for our purposes today, I'm going to look just at a couple of passages that I think are very closely related. Talk about how they present their ideas because these ideas are not presented in a straightforward, linear uh, tract. Uh, they are, as I said, recounted conversations. Sometimes he even uses parables. So they need to be interpreted. They need to be worked through. So we're going to work through a couple passages. And then what I would like to do is, having worked through those ideas, see how they can apply to modern day social structures and political relationships. The first passage I'd like to look at is section 1A7. Now, a little bit about how the book is organized. It's organized into seven books, which in English translation are generally numbered, each of which is divided into an A half and a B half, each half of which is divided into numbered chapters. So, this is book 1A, chapter 7, toward the end. In this chapter, Mencius is talking to King Xuan of the Kingdom of Qi. He talks to Xuan a lot. King Xuan is one of the flawed monarchs with whom Mencius has some of his most productive conversations. The guy is a bit of a blockhead. He wants to know how he can become king, as he puts it. What he really wants to know is how he can assert power. What Mencius is trying to teach him is how his power can become legitimate. So there's a tension here between the legitimate king on the one hand and the tyrant on the other. Or if we want to put this in modern terms, there's a tension between the legitimate political regime on the one hand and the tyrannical regime on the other. Schwann is inclined toward tyranny, and Mencius is trying to steer him towards genuine, legitimate kingship or genuine, legitimate rule. This chapter is one of the longest in the book. Actually, I think it is the longest in the book. It lays out, in ways that I don't need to address right now, a pretty fully developed theory of political legitimacy. And then it comes around, finally, to the bit that I'm going to read you. And with your indulgence, I'll just read the last few paragraphs of the chapter, and then we'll talk about it. Mencius said, Only a noble is capable of having a constant heart while lacking a constant livelihood. As for the people, if they lack a constant livelihood, it follows that they will lack a constant heart. No one who lacks a constant heart will avoid dissipation and evil. When they thereupon sink into crime, to go and punish the people is to trap them. When there are benevolent persons in positions of authority, how is it possible for them to trap the people? 
For this reason, the enlightened ruler must regulate the people's livelihood to ensure that it is sufficient, on the one hand, to serve their fathers and mothers, and on the other hand, to nurture their wives and children. In good years, they are always full. In years of famine, they escape death. Only then do they rush toward the good, and thus the people follow the ruler easily. Nowadays, the people's livelihood is regulated so that it is neither sufficient to serve fathers and mothers, nor is it sufficient to nurture their wives and children. Even in good years, they are always bitter. In years of famine, they cannot escape death. This is a case in which one fears not having the means to escape death. How could they have the leisure for cultivating ritual and righteousness? If your majesty wishes to put the way into effect, then why not return to the root? Plant every household of five acres with mulberry trees to cultivate silkworms, and fifty-year-olds can wear silk. Let the nurturing of chickens, pigs, and dogs not be neglected, and seventy-year-olds can eat meat. If you do not disturb the seasonal work in each field of one hundred acres, a clan with eight mouths need not go hungry. If you are careful that the schools engage in instruction, explaining the righteousness of filiality and brotherliness, then those with gray hair will not carry loads on the roads. It has never happened that a person fails to become the king when his old people wear silk and eat meat, and the black-haired people are neither hungry nor cold. And now, just to have all of the Mencius texts that I want to refer to out front, I'll read the next bit that I have in mind. I'd originally thought just to look at passage 6a8, which is a short piece about the tragedy of a place called Ox Mountain, kind of a parable. But before doing that, I also want to read the beginning of 6a7, just to serve as a, as a preface to that. I think it's important to the discussion we're having right now, and you'll see why. So here's the beginning of 6a7. Mencius said, In years of plenty, most young men are gentle. In years of poverty, most young men are violent. It is not that the potential that heaven confers on them varies like this. They are like this because of what sinks and drowns their hearts. Consider barley. Sow the seeds and cover them. The soil is the same, and the time of planting is also the same. They grow rapidly, and by the time of summer solstice they have all ripened. Although there are some differences, these are due to the richness of the soil and to the unevenness of the rain and inhuman effort. Hence, in general, things of the same kind are all similar. Why would one have any doubt about this when it comes to humans alone? We and the sage are of the same kind. All right, now we'll skip ahead to 6a8, which begins just a few paragraphs later. Mencius said, The trees of Ox Mountain were once beautiful, but because it bordered on a large state, hatchets and axes besieged it. Could it remain verdant? Due to the respite it got during the day or night, and the moisture of rain and dew, there were sprouts and shoots growing there, but oxen and sheep came and grazed on them. Hence, it was as if they were barren. Seeing it barren, people believed that there had never been any timber there, but could this be the nature of the mountain? When we consider what is present in people, could they truly lack the hearts of benevolence and righteousness? The way that they discard their genuine nature is like the hatchets and the axes in relation to the trees. With them besieging it day by day, can it remain beautiful? With the respite it gets during the day or night, and the restorative efforts of its morning chi, their likes and dislikes are sometimes close to those of others. But then what they do during the day again fetters and destroys it. If the fettering is repeated, then the evening chi is insufficient to preserve it. If the evening chi is insufficient to preserve it, then one is not far from an animal. Others see that he is an animal, and think that there was never any capacity there. But is this the nature of what a human is like inherently? Hence, if it gets nourishment, there is nothing that will not grow. If it merely loses its nourishment, there is nothing that will not vanish. Confucius said, Grasped, then preserved, abandoned, then lost. Its goings and comings have no fixed time. No one knows its home. Was it not the heart of which he spoke? So, how do we read this? To start off, in the bit from 1A7 that I read you, Mencius says that 
Only a noble is capable of having a constant heart while lacking a constant livelihood. This is a term that needs to be clarified. From Confucius onward, when a Confucian refers to a noble or a gentleman or any of that innately aristocratic language, what they're referring to is not somebody of aristocratic birth, but somebody of moral or ethical accomplishments. That is, the ethical gentleman or gentle person is one of the objects of Confucian ethical cultivation. So what he's saying here is not only an aristocrat has the emotional or ethical or moral fortitude to be good, to be constant while lacking a constant livelihood, while lacking the sufficiency of remaining alive, the economic sufficiency to remain alive. What he's rather saying is that in order to have this fortitude, you must first become ethically cultivated. And, and Mencius gets into this very explicitly in lots of places. And Confucius also, by the way, does, uh, does delve into it. We can't assume that everyone simply has the obligation to become morally or ethically cultivated in a vacuum, regardless of context, regardless of circumstance. So when Mencius says, no one who lacks a constant heart will avoid dissipation and evil, what he's saying is that no one who has not taken the time and put in the work, but also had the opportunity to become morally cultivated, can avoid running into really bad circumstances. As he says, when they thereupon sink into crime, to go and punish the people is to trap them. All right, this is the reason why I wanted to discuss this passage in this particular context. I'll read it again. When they thereupon sink into crime, to go and punish the people is to trap them. And this goes along with his discussion of what he calls regulating livelihoods. Now, this is antiquated terminology, so I'm going to translate it into a more contemporary language. What he's talking about here is the responsibility of the regime to institute policies that make it possible for people to work and to benefit from their work. Now, somebody who is someone who embraces radical individualism, who says or claims or asserts that regardless of circumstance, you're still solely responsible for your conduct is quite frankly, I think, talking out of their ass, having no idea about how human beings actually behave. And on the other hand, is absolving the regime of all of its responsibility toward the people over whom it has authority. What this basic argument here is, is that there are always prior conditions to any individual's behavior or any group's behavior. And those conditions are socioeconomic. They have to do with what Mencius refers to as regulating people's livelihoods. They have to do with responsible social policies, with the necessity of people having enough to securely survive, not to live luxuriously, but to live minimally decent lives without worrying about losing that bare minimum. And only then do they have the leisure. And, and the idea of having leisure, of having time to cultivate oneself is, is central to Confucian political theory. Right from the beginning of this tradition, we are not simply machines. We are living beings whose needs are real and whose needs imply a justified claim on the community and context in which we live. So to extend this further, a social system that accidentally or deliberately, and quite frankly, this has been going on long enough in North America, not just in the United States, that privileges one class or one group or one race over another, knowingly, and there is no way by this point that it can't be knowingly, is depriving those people not only of material necessities, not only of opportunities to which they have a just and equitable claim, but is also depriving them of the opportunity to cultivate their full humanity. That is, from a Confucian point of view, if you don't cultivate your ethical character, you're not behaving as a fully realized human being. So denying people the conditions under which they can reasonably be expected 
to cultivate an ethical character is denying them the opportunity to realize their full humanity. Or to put it another way, it is a form of systemic dehumanization. That is, it is setting them up to lose. And what Mencius is getting at here, and he has other places where he is even more radical for somebody writing in the, the, the fourth century BC, is that if you set someone up to lose, and this is what any inequitable system does, how fucking dare you then blame them when they either lose or get angry about having been set up? That's what we're dealing with right now. An entire population has been systematically for generations set up to lose and then blamed for losing and then additionally blamed when they stand up and enrage and demand that the system be rectified. Looked at that way, the situation in which many minorities find themselves is downright fucking Kafkaesque. And if Mencius had ever read Kafka, he would recognize that. And that is what Mencius means by trapping the people. So he goes on to say, nowadays people's livelihood is regulated so that it is neither sufficient to serve their fathers and mothers, nor is it sufficient to nurture their wives and children. Now again, translating this into modern terms, it simply means that policies being enacted right now are such that entire groups of people are being systematically deprived of the opportunity to seek the employment that they need to secure their own well-being and the well-being of their families. And what I'm not saying here is that Mencius is arguing for what, um, what some folks like to call the nanny state. He's not. This becomes apparent uh, elsewhere in his book and some of the passages that I've shown you. What he is arguing for is that policies be enacted and followed that give everyone sufficient opportunity at securing their material or economic well-being, stability, to the degree that they're not living in dire poverty, that they're not living in fear of losing what little that they have. That is, it's the responsibility of the regime to cultivate conditions in which people are capable and have the opportunity to work to better themselves both materially and, and ethically or morally. And if those conditions are not guaranteed, then the blame for people not falling in line behind the government, not be behaving as calm, well-ordered citizens lies with the regime and its failings before it lies with the people who are not supporting the regime that is not supporting them. That is, there is always in Confucianism a sense of reciprocity. Yes, the citizen owes certain obligations to the state, but the state has a prior obligation to the citizen. And if that obligation is not met, the citizen's obligation is voided. And at that point, the regime loses its legitimacy. So when Mencius speaks about, even in good years, people being angry, and in bad years, people fearing death, he's speaking not merely about life in traditional agricultural China. He's speaking about life in any system where there is an assumption of reciprocity between governed and government. And when he asks how could they have leisure for cultivating ritual and righteousness? And this is why I had to add that bit about ritual a little earlier on. What he's saying very clearly is that those rituals, those rites, those ceremonies, not just the big ones, but the little day-to-day -day ones that help society run, that make it possible for society to run, and for people to have harmonious relationships with each other, and this is one of the goals of Confucian social thought, that harmony that ritual, that obligation to engage in ritual only follows upon conditions that allow sufficient time for the thoughtful cultivation of the behavior, not just the mindless parroting of it. Confucius and Mencius have no patience with that, but the engaging in social relations and ritual behaviors and even, as I said, the most basic courtesies not by rote, but from a genuine,
conviction that this is the right thing to do because you've had the time to think about your commonality with everyone else that you encounter. This relationship between conditions and behavior is picked up again in passage 6a7. Mencius talks about the behavior of young men depending largely on the conditions in which they live. That is, he says that in years of plenty, they're gentle, well-behaved, and in years of poverty, they're violent. Notice here, he's not saying how people should behave. He's saying how people do behave. He's not creating an ideal that he's projecting onto people and expecting them to live up to. He's simply recognizing human beings for what they are. People in favorable conditions will tend to behave favorably. Doesn't matter what political system they're living under. And people in desperate conditions will tend to behave desperately. Doesn't matter what political system or ideology they're living under. These are secondary considerations. What Mencius speaks about is bad conditions, as he puts it, sinking and drowning people's hearts. One of the words we have for that now in our everyday language is trauma. If you put people in traumatic situations, if you traumatize people, if you have them living in fear of their lives and their livelihoods, you don't have the right to expect them to behave as you might like them to behave if they had the comfort and security that you happen to have. And here's one of the places where he develops his agricultural metaphor. He describes barley being planted at the same time, but in different places and under different soil conditions and being tended to with different degrees of care. Well, naturally, the barley planted in the most favorable soil and given the advantage of the greatest degree of care is going to fare better, is going to do better. And the barley that's planted in barren soil and then left to fend for itself or even worse is not going to thrive. And when that happens, you don't blame the barley. As Mencius says, everybody is equal in nature. So if everybody is equal in nature, then what makes them different is, well, there are a couple of things. One is their conditions, and two is the effort that's put into cultivation, including self-cultivation. But again, going back to the passage from 1A7, if you're working four jobs just to keep a roof over your head and still don't know whether you're going to pay the rent next month, what time do you have to consider the so-called finer things in life? you're too busy trying to sustain life. But Mencius recognizes in the 4th century BC that human beings are all innately equal. As he says, we and the sage are of the same kind. This agricultural metaphor is wonderful because he's able to address questions of things of the same nature being equal in a relatively value-neutral way extend it to all kinds of other things, then he simply asks, why would we doubt that this is also true with human beings? So if we are all the same, if we are all equal, and we're living under a social system that manufactures difference, then when those differences emerge, we don't get to turn around and blame the people on whom the system is working. What we get to blame is the people for whom the system is working. And this brings us around to the passage on Ox Mountain, and I am almost tempted to call it Ox Mountain, Minnesota. Mencius' description of Ox Mountain is genuinely tragic, and I think it's one of the more poetic passages in the text. What he's describing is a landscape that is initially fertile, initially full of life, but because it's constantly under attack from outside, constantly having its resources depleted, it never has time to recover. So its forests are used up and it looks like a barren place that has always been barren. So Mencius asks of this apparently barren place, is this the nature of the mountain? There's a lot going on here. The most important element is probably about the legitimacy of judgment. Seeing the state that something is in now, it's easy to make the assumption that that was always its state. But as with the other passages we've been talking about, what Mencius is discussing here is, is historical contingency. Something that is naturally good, naturally full of life, can be made to seem otherwise when acted upon and not sufficiently cared for. 
and he draws the explicit analogy with the human being. And here, the analogy works both ways, doesn't it? On the one hand, while we are all born with certain innate capacities, we may not all choose to cultivate them in the same way, and those choices bear consequences. On the other hand, some of us are born into more nurturing environments than others. Some of us find ourselves in more nurturing environments than others, regardless of where we happen to have been born. And these also affect how we will seem, how we'll be perceived by other people. And as with the barrenness of the mountain, it's easy to look at a person's current circumstances and say that is the person's nature, when in fact what we are looking at is the accumulated effect of multiple causes over a very long time. Mencius refers to the assaults, the challenges, the hardships that a mountain or a person can go through in a day, depleting what he calls their chi. And I want to talk a bit about that because that's the only term that, that really we've left untranslated. So when he says that if the assaults come day after day after day, the morning chi and the evening chi is insufficient to regenerate the mountain or the person. The easiest way to understand that for our purposes is just in reference to sufficient time to recuperate physically and psychologically, to regenerate oneself. That is, everybody faces hardship. That's simply a part of life. We face hardship, sometimes for a long time, and then hopefully we have time to recover, to regenerate ourselves. But if the hardship is constant, if you are constantly under threat, physically, psychologically, then such time as you have for rest between those episodes of facing a world that's been constructed to take advantage of you and constructed to keep you down will be insufficient. Everybody can be worn down. And what Mencius recognizes is that if we are always under threat, if there is always something draining the life from us, draining our strength from us, this has consequences both physically and psychologically. Again, if I want to put this in more contemporary terms, what he is talking about is a situation of chronic stress. Stress kills people. And living under constant economic threat, constant threat by police, constant threat by other groups who actually can carry guns in public, this can only create stress and often create trauma, both in the individual and in the population subjected to that. And it's exactly that that so many minorities in our society are subjected to. So Mencius finishes this passage with these wonderful lines, Hence, if it merely gets nourishment, there is nothing that will not grow. If it merely loses its nourishment, there is nothing that will not vanish. It's that simple. It's that simple. So where does this leave us in relation to Mencius on the one hand and current events on the other? Well, we have this wonderfully humane thinker who bases his understanding of human nature on his observations of human behavior, again, as we'll get into in a future episode, who recognizes that all human beings are innately equal and that we're all inclined to be good. I'm not really sure I like the word good. I think I might actually say are inclined toward pro-social behavior. This actually seems to fit the situation pretty well. Confucianism as a whole, and Mencius in particular, certainly recognizes the communal nature of human beings, the social nature of our species, and understands that we are not islands, that we are not radically independent from our circumstances. While we're all born with certain inclinations, tastes, what have you, we're to a large degree what our context shapes us to be. And our context includes family, but also the broader socio-political context in which we live. And this, again, as I've mentioned before, is perfectly in keeping with the findings of contemporary social science. Our day-to-day -day interactions literally affect the structure of our brain, which, of course, is what we usually mean, I think, whether we know it or not, when we refer to our mind. Trauma, stress, affect the brain in ways that affect behavior, period. The end. 
So for a society to take no responsibility for the trauma and stress that it imposes inequitably on some groups more than on others is profoundly dishonest, given the knowledge that we now have available to us. Mencius has a really good sense of what we now call innate human dignity. And he does see this as universal. He's very, very clear about that. And he's also clear about the mechanisms by which that dignity can be undermined and sometimes even systematically or systemically undermined. And this is what he means when he refers to a regime trapping the people. A system that does that to its population has no claim in Mencius's eyes, and quite frankly in mine, to legitimacy. Now, does that mean that it should be automatically violently overthrown? No, Mencius doesn't think so, and neither do I. There are mechanisms that we can go through to fix the situation, and in our society, one of those mechanisms is protest. And I really need to underscore that the vast majority of the protests that have happened since Mr. Floyd's death have been peaceful. You don't see that in the news all that much. You see the fires, you see the destruction. And much of the fires and destruction have been caused by agent provocateurs, dishonest bad actors. Or sometimes they've simply been outright caused by the police, which pretty much makes the point of the protests, doesn't it? So to work toward a sign-off and maybe sum up part of what I hope to achieve with this series, well, on the one hand, we live in times that in my 54 years are unprecedented. We live in a time that will shape the consciousness of a generation, of my daughter's generation, one way or another. We also live embedded in a long, long history spanning multiple cultures, all of them, in which people have tried to come up with different answers for how to organize their societies and how to not just practically but ethically sort out their social relationships, sort out the structural questions of what you do when you have multiple people from multiple groups with different and often conflicting histories and different and often conflicting narratives having to interact with each other. Confucianism, recognizing innate human equality, I think has something to offer to the conversation that North America is having now. I think it has something really valuable to offer to that conversation, as I hope I've begun to illustrate in this episode, and as I will continue to try to illustrate in future episodes. Not that I'm trying to get people to be Confucian, but if there's ever been a time for a society to look not just deeply into itself, which we need to do, but also to look honestly and searchingly abroad for other ideas and maybe better ideas than the ones we've been using so far. Ways of bringing a little more depth and a little more nuance into our understanding of ourselves and our relations. I think it really has to be now. And I also think I have probably talked long enough for one episode. So, thank you for listening. I hope you found something worthwhile in here. And I hope you'll be back. In the meantime, if you want to be in touch with feedback or suggestions for future episodes, you can find me at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com. And I am just getting a page started on Facebook, Eclectic Humanist, that should be easy enough to find. So by all means, seek me out there. In the meantime, bye for now. Thank you again, and be good to each other.